yeah, maybe maybe let's start and um, uh, welcome everyone and thank you for uh, for attending this session. We have a very exciting one uh, on um, knowledge and understanding of uh, urban processes. Uh, we have different papers that bridge uh, very well um, th theoretical advances um, on what the city is to, to new methodologies and instruments to measure um, and an an analyze the city. Um, and I've seen, I, I've seen uh, the papers uh, and I've, I've learned something new uh, with each one, um, so I'm, I'm quite excited. Uh, I'm going to present the, 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 the four or the three so far um, presenters. Uh, then we'll uh, let them speak for 15 minutes uh, and then we'll have questions at, at the end, if that's okay. First, um, and from uh, uh, the Lebanese University and uh, University of Versailles, um, Jumana Steven, who she's with us uh, via Skype, um, she will uh, guide us through the case of an urban park in Beirut uh, using the lens of uh, complexity thinking. Uh, then uh, Rodrigo Almeida, uh, from here, from Dinamia Ischte, uh will uh, talk to us about urban semiotics uh, related to heritage uh, in mid-size uh, Portuguese city, uh, Tumar. Um, then we were supposed to have uh, bar uh, a group of Brazilian researchers, Barbara Siqueira, Laini Santos and Renato Saboia, but so far they, uh, they haven't arrived. Um, they would be talking to us about uh, segregated urban space. Uh, we'll keep them on hold, and if uh, they arrive, um, we'll, we'll see what they have to tell us. And then finally, uh, Catarina Pinheiro from the um, University of Minho will tell us uh, how remote sensing uh, can be used to provide uh, deeper understandings of urban change um, in uh, Guimarães. So, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, before I, I leave it to Jumana, as you all know, the, the Portuguese match is immediately after this session, so I will be very strict uh, with uh, keeping time, okay? Uh, Jumana, thank you, and you can, uh, you can start. Yeah. Okay, hello. So, hello everyone. I will be talking uh, about complexity thinking as a new systemic language towards sustainable urban cohesion and, the case, and introduce the case of Hirschbeil. Why is it? Okay. So first I will talk about the difference between the analytical and the systemic approach, introduce the case of Beirut, and then talk about complexity thinking both as a, as a language and as a tool. So as a language, we will talk about the difference between complex and complicated, a set versus a system, emergent properties and synergy, and as a tool we will apply the case of Hush Beirut with the systemic orientation tool and come up, come up with some conclusions. So, what is there in common between a lake, a company, a city, a living cell, and an elephant? Maybe nothing if we only see them and examine them with a classical instrument of knowledge called the analytical approach. But however, if we go beyond this convention,
Não, acho que depois esses brasileiros uh, são três. Uh, eu, eu proponho o seguinte, se no uh, I, I propose the, the following, if in the next minute we, we can reach Jumana, we'll move on to, to Rodrigo, uh, and then we'll try again uh, at the end with, uh, with Jumana. Okay, just one minute, sorry. Uh, ah, okay, she's trying to... Okay. okay so We're back. back. Hello? Hi, yes. I okay. We're, we're, we're back. We were um, on the elephant slide. Yes, perfect. So, can you see my shared? Okay, share. No, we can't. Uh, oh, you can? Okay. Yeah, we can. We can again. Okay. Yes. Can proceed. Okay. So I was talking about what is there in common between the lake? No, we actually moved forward. Yes, perfect. That's where where we were. Okay. Analytical and the systemic approach. We saw that the analytical approach actually tries to compose systems to their constituent components and parts. To, to try to understand them. And it's also called reductionism. But for the systemic approach, it's actually, uh, it's actually by increasing the connectivity between these elements, we can't see them, we can't analyze them this way because it's the connections that begin to define the system. And the focus is rather on the connections, not on the constituent parts. So in those cases, such as the study of brains, forests, cities, and beehives, we can adopt the systemic approach. So the systemic approach is particularly in, uh, interested in systems that have imprecision, randomness, instability in time, uncertainty, and unpredictability. This is why they may be very suitable for the study of urban cases, for cities and urban cases. And uh, already ecology, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yeah, okay. everything's good. So, Okay, so uh, ecology, economy, biology, information technology, psychology, and family therapy have already invested in this approach. So what can, it, uh, what can this interdisciplinary approach uh, offer to urban studies? And could it change the way we perceive, diagnose, and plan the city? So we will talk about the case of Hersh Beirut. It's actually a triangular urban park in the heart of the Lebanese capital, Beirut. It's located on the former demarcation line of the Lebanese Civil War that ended in 1990. It's actually close to the public since the end of the war, and it has failed to play its role as a connecting public space. And also, it is contributing to the physical separation and social segregation between uh, bordering neighborhoods. So, uh, what can what can complexity thinking give us? Uh, new perspective and complex and offer us uh, in order to examine the case of Hersh Beirut. And since it's actually uh, because of the dynamics of this urban system, should we still examine it in a linear analytical way or uh, should we use the complexity thinking? So complexity thinking as a uh, has two parts. It's actually a language and it has diagnosis tools. It, has, it offers us a language as a lexicon, as an urban lexicon that we will be introducing later later, and as a graphic language, also called system modeling. And for the diagnosis tools, there are many, but we chose to work um, with a tool called systemic triangulation that we will introduce and apply. As a lexicon, first, it's, it's really important to know the difference between complex and complicated, because complex does not mean complicated. A car, for example, is a very complicated machine but it can be completely understood through the functional decomposition of its parts. So the whole equals only the sum of its parts and nothing more. And it has a linear behavior 
of cause and effect relations between the, the constituent parts. This is why it has a predictable behavior. On the other hand, a living organism, the brain, or a historical phenomenon, is complex in the sense that it can be decomposed and reconstructed from simple and independent elements. And this is why it exhibits emergent behavior, and it has a nonlinear, unpredictable behavior also. So uh, secondly, we should know the difference between a set and a system. So let's start with uh, what is not a system. A group of things that are not connected and do not work together is not a system. This is what we call a set, or a simple collection of elements, like the stack of bricks, that can be a good example. The, comp the compositions were not designed to work together. Thus, we, de we describe them by simply describing the properties of each element alone. And that tells us everything we need to know. But when we take a set of bricks and build a house with it, we can no longer describe them as simply a set of bricks. Because by building our house, we have now added a number of relationships and a particular arrangement that allows them to function as an interdependent entity. And this interdependent entity, our house, is a system. So this can help us illustrate uh, a key feature of systems and complexity thinking, something we call emergence, so, uh, or an emergent property. An emergent property is actually a collective property that is not present in any of the individual elements of the system but which emerges in a new and unpredictable way because of their diversity and high level of connectivity. Like the case of, uh, of building the house architecture and uh, the case of beehives and brains, all the other examples. So, uh, uh, and synergy also, the concept of synergy, is the act itself of interaction and cooperation produ producing this combined effect or this emergent property, which is greater than the sum of their uh, individual effects. So uh, the case of uh, cities, cities are often described as the richest example of emergence in human interaction. Because a city contains uh, some, uh, some emergent properties that can either be constructive emergent properties caused by positive synergies, like a good quality of life, public space appropriation, social cohesion, collective memory, or it can have, it can have a set of destructive uh, emergent uh, properties caused by negative synergies, like violence, urban exclusion, traffic congestion, and gentrification. So our goal is to visualize the problems of the case of Hirsch now in particular through systems modeling and discover this emergent properties and the synergetic opportunities that are present. Okay, so um, as a tool, we thought that complexity thinking is both uh, offers both a language, an urban language, and uh, um, diagnosis, urban diagnosis tools. So as a tool, we chose to work with systemic triangulation. Uh, this, in systemic triangulation, we, we observe a complex system through three complementary angles. The structural angle, or how the system is composed, the functional angle, or what the system does, and the historical angle, or what the system becomes. And finally, we visualize the information and we collect with these angles uh, we, uh, that we collected in uh, visual graphic models. For example, the structural uh, angle model of hirsch Wood, we collected the information and we vis visualized them. And we concluded that in the structure, just accessibility uh, based on sectarian tensions, also that the park is surrounded by a segregated social system and that there is, even inside the park, a dividing fence creating social segregation even inside the park. As for the functional angle, we concluded that actually uh, there is a socioeconomic segregation and that Hirsch Beirut is actually playing the opposite role of a public space. It's playing the role of separation between the elements uh, in, uh, in, his urban in its urban context. And finally, for the historical angle, we noticed a persistent public resistance against the policies of municipality throughout the history of the park. And the survey that we did on Hirsch Beirut allowed us to recognize the presence of exclusion 
based on social class and a general perceived urban exclusion marked among the park visitors. So, uh, in conclusion, the visualizations suggest that the major recurrent problem of Hash Beirut system is actually urban segregation. And segregation as a socio political emergent property which structures the system as divided entities controlled by fear of the other. So, in the case of Hush Beirut, and for different interconnected factors, neighborhoods around it have self organized based on sectarian division around the park, which resulted in segregation. And a second conclusion also that uh, there is an underlying social complexity which induced continuous advocating for the park from different parts and public resistance and continuous activism. So, uh, based on the findings, some factors have actually induced this segregation, among other negative emergent properties. Therefore, some specific synergetic opportunities should be taken into consideration in order to rebalance the system. So, uh, some of the factors uh, that we have uh, concluded is that it's part of a dysfunctional uh, green space system in the city. It's located on the periphery of the city, alongside a uh, demarcation war line, and surrounded by uh, culturally, economically, socially, and sectarian heter heterogeneous neighborhoods. So what can be some synergetic opportunity is to actually in induce synergies between Hirsch Beirut and other uh, green public spaces in the city, by creating a green network, for example. And also, uh, some factors that we have uh, concluded are the fear and the collective memory related to the civil war, and the lack of security of the current lack of security, and the differences between generations uh, in the perception of uh, Hirsch Beirut and uh, their city. So some of the synergetic opportunities that, that we can do, that we can uh, uh, take advantage of, is inducing social synergies between these war, the, between these generations, the war generation and the, the new generation that has not lived the war, in order to eliminate the, the residual, residual fear of the other. So uh, in conclusion, we have uh, we explored the relationships established between complexity thinking as a language the political and economic dynamics of Hirsch Beirut, and the underlying social complexity and activism. So, uh, maybe uh, addressing cities as complex systems could first deepen our understanding of the complex reality of urban problems, and second, help us perceive green spaces, green public spaces, as a main subsystem in the city, crucial for social cohesion in particular. And, uh, complex, and uh, 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 getting introduced and, and understanding concepts of complexity, emergence, and self-organization, maybe it could help us uh, perceive urban actors as catalysts that can induce synergies and positive emergent properties in the city, instead of trying to control them maybe by uh, to control the urban phenomena through classical project design. Thank you. Thank you, Jumana. Uh, we'll probably have time for one or two questions before we, we disconnect uh, with you. So I'm going to invite the audience uh, for questions. Um, I, ha I have one uh, to start off. If you, if you could tell us a little bit more about um, your uh, the third part of your methodology. So you you did a, a pre-survey with uh, the parks um, users and then a survey and then something you you refer to as um, systemic triangulation, right? Yes. Uh, I think it could be interesting for the audience as well to 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 get uh, to get a. a a bit more detail of what this systemic triangulation uh, might involve. Yes, so uh, in fact, I uh, first uh, I did the pre-survey as you have mentioned, uh, trying just to get like insights about the Hirsch Beirut and what's actually causing these all these complex problems. 
And then I did a survey, a detailed survey. Uh, so I collected the data. As for the methodology, uh, triangulation is actually a method that has started with physics, with with uh, with uh, and uh, IT studies, and uh, it it has been adopted in many other disciplines that I have uh, talked about, like biology and medicine in particular, and other uh, disciplines. And uh, now I'm, I was trying to apply it to urban study. So um, in the case of uh, systemic triangulation, the data that we collected from the survey and the pre-survey, and also all sorts of collected other collected data, are actually vis visualized and organized in only three angles. This is the this is the method, and these three angles are the functional uh, angle. A structural angle and a historical angle. The structural first, the structural angle is based on uh, three um, uh, not layers, three uh, uh, three levels. Mm -hmm. The um, the ma the micro level, the the micro level, the mic the macro level, and the mezzo level. And uh, it's about it's actually you can see them. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and uh, the the micro level is about the internal division of uh, any system, any complex system, the internal structure. So I uh, concluded some points from the internal uh, structure. The mezzo scale is actually about the interface of uh, a system. So in our case, the interface of Hash Beirut, uh, the, of the part, the actual interface. And what are the problems of the interface? So we can see that it's actually on the periphery of the city. It's along the, alongside the demarcation line um, and many other problems. And thirdly, the macro, the macro level is about its role in its, uh, its surroundings. So uh, the scale of uh, the surrounding. Well, we've lost you, man, again. So maybe now we'll move on to the other uh, presenters. Uh, Rodrigo. Thank 
Uh, okay, so can everybody hear me? Cool. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank Jumana because she did a wonderful job helping me do this presentation unbeknowingly be in ways that I hope that you'll realize in a, in a moment. So my work is about heritage interpretation in cultural systems. Um, and uh, in line with this track, it's what I come here to present is less uh, theoretical and empirical uh, analysis than it is a sort of uh, conceptual path that I had to take to come to this understanding of what cultural systems are. So I came into urban studies um, focused on studying heritage interpretation, but very quickly I realized that the sort of questions that we had to ask, so how is heritage con constructed by the people, how, what kinds of things and, uh, and narratives are present, um, how it changes over time, were really, really, really hard. In, not hard in the sense that I didn't know how to, to answer them, I simply didn't know what kinds of, what specifically to ask for, uh, what kinds of entities to go for, what, how, what methods to use. Um, and I was struck by the fact that heritage studies have so many, so many different approaches and that I thought I would really need to, to have a, a firm basis. And I thought that I would find that in urban studies. But I didn't. Because basically, as, as anyone that studies urban studies here will know, when you talk to an economist about culture or about heritage, but mostly, uh, I'll be focusing on culture because it's a broader topic. When you talk to an economist, an, an anthropologist, a sociologist, or a geographer about culture, they will be not only talking about different things, they will be focusing on things so different that they don't even seem to be related to the same cities. So I came to this idea or this question of whether we're actually all studying the same city or we're just going around cutting pieces of, uh, uh, of cities and making sense of them. And um, in line with some, of, some things that have been said here today, I, I thought that one way to go, to, to go would be to construct a sort of ontology, focusing on the things that, that, that we would like to, to care, and specifically following in line with a lot of uh, concerns that have been raised to kind of create a micro foundational ontology in the sense that I'll be focusing at the lowest level on agents and actions but trying to and in that sense I thank Germana because she explained the concept of emergence and the, uh, and the systems to see what emerges out of, uh, out of those actions. So just to clear up the house uh, quickly I, I had to, to go the sociologist way of just casting culture, heritage, city, and pretty much any, any abstract concept as a fuzzy set in the sense of, of being just a collection of entities that are indexed by, by something called semiosis, and which is pretty simply just people thinking that it is so due to a given, a given reason. And uh, I tried focusing on studying systems because what came to mind was that we don't really normally care about the specific things that, that we care about, only when we're talking ab about planning. In theoretical terms, we're mostly concerned with how cultural systems interact with economic systems. So for instance, how, how much does it matter that I'll, that I'll be purchasing uh, a given touristic uh, attraction if, because in some way it is commodifying their local culture? And in an, it, Although that can be t treated in micro terms, I think it would be more useful to talk, uh, talk of systems in this Luhmannian, uh, Parsonian notion of a system being a set of actions and a set of interpretations. And I see that as a possible way of making sense of urban studies, in the sense that we won't be studying cities, we will be studying systems within cities, which might sound confusing, but in some way it kind of helped me go through this. But this still didn't help me in making sense of what a cultural or a heritage system should be. And so I tried generalizing this, and it, this is a very meek proposal based on the, the stuff I, that I've read of treating systems as, free, uh, as being marked by three kinds of actions, by communication, knowledge acquisition, and production, and one cognitive relation, interpretation. Simply, simply put, basically, thinking that a church belongs to something like national history or to Gothic, uh, Gothic architecture. And I'll be focusing specifically on interpretation because what it feels to me is that if we treat interpretation as a sufficiently broad concept, we, then we can start 
speaking of things like economic utility or cultural value as being based on this uh, on these interpretations and it also opens up two ways of analysis which are the the main things I wanted to bring you the the main methods I used to try to make sense uh, sense of this one of them kind of trying to tackle the notion of what is and what should be considered heritage which is a huge topic within heritage studies of whether heritage was constructed in the 1980s or in the 1990s as, a, a, as trying to express a clear notion of, an, a, a, of a national identity, of commodifying the, the, the culture that, should be, that, that people should be thinking about, of expressing communities' memories, whether, that, the, whether tourism plays a, plays a role into this. Basically, the way I thought that we could, we, we could analyze this is kind of decompose all of those topics into modalities and look at the way that people construct heritage out of those modalities. It also allows us to, to enter this, to kind of create social relationships out of this because if you look at it in this way, and it'll be easier if I just skip a couple of slides and go right into this, this is basically a network and it can be treated as a social, ne uh, social net network, analyzable with the tools of social network analysis, but essentially be it allows us to think of how, in, uh, uh, of how certain concepts are re related to certain individuals which can be cut up in social groups and, with, and uh, essentially try to make sense of what that could, uh, th th that could mean in social terms or political terms or how in, at the, in the last resort we can think to intervene in, in these contexts, namely in what we should choose to preserve or what we, should, uh, or, or what we shouldn't in terms of the, uh, the, po uh, the population. And in that sense, if we formalize it this way, we can also, we can also create indexes, which I know some people are not, uh, are not such great fans of, but I personally like because although they have a lot of limitations, they allow us to at least have a, s not a semblance of objectivity, which is not what we're going for here, it's basically a common language in which to talk, uh, uh, talk of what should be valued. And you can construct indices of cultural value based on the population, uh, on populations, which is what I did. Um, the previous image was basically an example of, uh, of the, the work I've been doing. Because I, I should have started at the beginning saying that this is an, an ongoing work, and I, haven't, uh, uh, and I don't bring the theoretical and empirical part mostly because I haven't, don't really have it yet. Um, but basically what I asked individuals was to photograph things that they thought had something to do with national history or local history and then try to map, the, uh, map them and see what, uh, what objects are more relevant to individuals in, what, uh, in some given contexts and from that obtain uh, basically something that can, be th that can be turned into a discussion of value and for a given population if a given cafe is very, val uh, very valuable and if you can assume that all indexes of different types of interpretation so from various systems can be put together, then you can, for instance, ask if you are building a, uh, if you want to build a parking lot over a church, you can ask if it's legitimate. You can ask individuals who rate how much they would like a uh, given parking lot to be over, over the place of the church, and you can also ask them how much they value the, the, the church within a set of modalities that you consider relev uh, relevant in that context. And you can make an, asser uh, an assertion of that. That doesn't solve politics. You'll still have to make assumptions and you'll still have to have a debate, but at least you can have, uh, at least the way I, I see it, you can have a debate in clearer terms and take the, um, the axiological part, the, the value-laden part into its own domain and leave the technical parts to this. And so this, no, th this idea of semiotics essentially try to answer what the constitution of heritage should be. But the second, but, but the second thing that tickled me was that you, and uh, this is especially true if you go into uh, cultural heritage tourism, uh, tourism of cultural heritage and uh, all of the studies that deal with the impact of tourism, is that we don't really have a clear, uh, although we speak very often the, of the fact that tourism changes uh, heritage and culture and local cultures, we don't really have an understanding or at least a, a good formal model of what those changes would be if tourism wasn't there. And so I kind of went exactly for that. And the tool I used <laughs> is something that I have become a great fan of uh, and would wish to proselytize you 
all with, which is agent-based modeling. It's a, essentially a, a way of designing models, conceptual models, in, a, in, in lines of code, but in, a, in actually an interface which is, pretty, uh, which is really, really easy, called in that logo. Um, and cast your assumptions as rules that agents must follow, define your agents in a given specific way, and try to ha see what emerges out of that. So for instance, you would say that if you assume that agents are all the same and that they continuously interpret uh, places, which is what I did, although I know that those are ridiculous assumptions and they are simply the product of me not having more computational power to run a more complex model, you can ask what, what, what comes out of that. And that's exactly what I did. Basically, the, um, the looks of it um, is kind of like this, which I know sounds kind of hellish and to be honest, I don't really know what's going on there, but, but um, the core of it, the, or at least in the interface, the, the, the core part of it was to define certain aspects of such a system that you, want to, that you want to analyze and then see what comes out of it when you ask the right questions. And so I, I asked some, some, some questions which, at, at least to me, seem pretty basic, which is what would happen if, indiv if individuals were left to interpret things forever in, in, a general, uh, in a continuous generation of new uh, agents, ba uh, being randomly assigned a given probability of interpreting f uh, things, and they didn't communicate. And obviously the model was, will stagnate. It will oscillate around the, sa the, the, the same values. People will, won't change their values too much. But if you introduce communication, then you have a whole set of, thing, uh, of, of things happening. The sort of emergent properties that Jomana, uh, Jomana was talking about do come up here because the way that the, the, the way that you program them, so for instance, given that I'm early on time, I'll, I'll actually go into this. I wasn't planning on it, but um, so for instance, if I, if I ask individuals, my agents, to always talk about the things that they, are mo that they have most in common with their groups, my intuition would be that over a very long period of time and with individuals, uh, with individuals successively taking the place of each other, that would converge to a uh, to consensus. But that's not what happens. What happens is that it does reach a consensus at a certain point, but then a ge another generation comes, uh, comes, um, comes on and another topic becomes, uh, b becomes dominant, which was also intuitive in retrospect, but simply not something I was expecting and not anything that I programmed in. I didn't program the notion of generation, yet the model could in be interpreted to be re representing that. And so, Basically what I brought, uh, what I wanted to bring today was the possibility of analyzing culture, which, uh, culture and heritage, these often treated, uh, uh, th these topics often treated as purely qualitative and uh, devoid of any capacity to, uh, of, of formal, uh, of formal analysis and saying that indeed you can do something like that and that that can have ver uh, various consequences for public policy because if you Abstract from this particular case, this could be used to model the effects of gentrification on various, uh, various scales. This could be used to analyze how uh, uh, housing, pri well, housing prices are really not that hard of a, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm seeing your, your reaction, but like, it doesn't seem like the sort of thing you would need an agent-based model. Like, you could theoretically do it with, uh, with systems dynamics, I think. I'm not sure, maybe. Um, Essentially, the, this the, this notion that these tools, which are things which have been around for, I mean, just a, 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 a quick thing. The first agent-based model used in so, in the social sciences was done by a sociologist in the 1970s, with a chess, with a chessboard. He basically grabbed a chessboard and tried to analyze the dynamics of segregation, which I find such a brilliant example of how. Well, actually, how sad it is that it never caught on. That I, I think we we should be tackling the complexity uh, of things uh, uh, of these topics by using this sort of. I don't know. Well, you you got the picture. Yeah, instruments. I I'm not very good at conclusions. So thank you. Thanks for the stimulating talk, Rodrigo. We'll move to Katarina now, and then uh, we'll have questions uh, to both of them at the end.
Is uh, Barbara C. Carey in the room? No. So I think it's official. Uh, we have one cancellation. <laughs> Bom dia a todos. Um, a minha apresentação, ela se centra então no contributo que a detecção remota pode dar para o estudo da evolução espaciotemporal de áreas urbanas e tem como caso de estudo dois municípios, o de Braga e o de Guimarães, que são, no fundo, as minhas áreas de estudo na minha tese de doutoramento. Uh, tal como se o geógrafo português Orlando Ribeiro, as ciências progridem tanto pela aquisição de factos novos como pela exploração de novos rumos de pesquisa. E estes devem-se quer ao desenvolvimento de conceitos originais, quer à descoberta ou invenção de instrumentos de análise mais poderosos. Um, no caso específico de, da geografia urbana, uh, nos últimos anos um, verificaram-se uh, importantes evoluções no, no conhecimento científico, uh, fruto da adoção de novos instrumentos e técnicas, e no caso específico que hoje estou a falar então dos satélites uma vez que estes permitem a observação da superfície terrestre de um modo sinótico e repetitivo. Assim, a detecção remota, alicerçada nos sistemas de informação geográfica, contribuíram para a alteração da análise das áreas urbanas. De realçar que este tipo de informação, desde há muito tempo utilizado noutros ramos da geografia, por exemplo, na climatologia urbana, só muito recentemente é que foi incorporado nos estudos de geografia urbana para o estudo da forma urbana, ou seja, o padrão urbano numa determinada data, e para os estudos de crescimento urbano, ou seja, o processo que se verifica entre duas datas. Uh, dando assim resposta a uma das questões centrais da geografia, desde a sua origem, que é como evoluem as áreas urbanas ao longo do tempo. Este tipo de informação permite então uma ligação entre as formas urbanas e os processos que lhes estão subjacentes. Uh, assim, os objetivos deste trabalho é... Uh, consistem a partir de seis imagens de Landsat, que, que é a mais longa e contínua série de dados adquiridos por detecção remota, uh, estabelecer a evolução urbana dos municípios de Braga e de Guimarães, entre 1984 e 2016, que foi o período em que os processos de crescimento urbano foram mais intensos. Uh, para tal, eu recorri uh, a um índice, o Landscape Expansion Index, proposto por Liu et al. em 2010, Uh, que eu mais à frente vou ter a oportunidade de explicar como é que funciona, uh, para determinar então a importância relativa de cada modo de crescimento, ou seja, a colmatação, a contiguidade e a dispersão. E procuro também perceber em que medida é que as dinâmicas urbanas destes municípios se relacionam com uma hipótese teórica proposta por dois autores, uh, que trabalham em conjunto, de Edsel et al. e Errol et al. em 2005, uh, de que a urbanização se desenvolve numa alternância cíclica de duas fases. Uma de dispersão, marcada pelo aparecimento de novas manchas urbanas, e outra de coalescência, ou seja, fusão de diferentes manchas numa única. Hum, como já referi então, anteriormente, uma das questões centrais da geografia urbana é como é que evoluem as áreas urbanas ao longo do tempo. Hum, porém, a falta de dados sempre constituiu um claro entrave ao estudo dos padrões urbanos, espaciais e temporais, Uh, pelo que a detecção remota, uh, tendo, considerando a sua amplitude uh, espacial e temporal, veio, atenuar, veio não só atenuar este problema, como viabilizou uma importante mudança de paradigma na análise das áreas urbanas. Ou seja, esta permite uma abordagem bottom-up, ou seja, da estrutura, é, é, a partir da estrutura urbana é possível perceber quais foram os processos que estiveram subjacentes. Ao contrário da abordagem mais tradicional das, dos estudos de geografia urbana, que então limitados por esta pela falta de dados, tinham uma abordagem top-down, ou seja, eles enfatizavam os processos de crescimento urbano e retratavam de modo secundário ou genérico a complexidade eh, espacial resultante da mudança urbana. Uh, então, estes retratos eh, sequenciais eh, da detecção remota têm vindo a ser utilizados para gerar índices de estrutura espacial que permitem descrever e quantificar então a estrutura espacial urbana. Um dos índices, então, que tem vindo a ser uh, frequentemente utilizado em estudos de, de, sobre a evolução espaciotemporal das áreas urbanas é o Landscape Expansion Index, uh, proposto por, um, por Liu et al. em 2010. Uh, este índice, contrariamente às métricas uh, convencionais, 
Ele não capta a informação da estrutura espacial do uma área urbana numa determinada data, mas sim a mudança que se verifica entre duas datas. Ou seja, para a aplicação deste índice é necessário duas, duas camadas de informação, no fundo duas layers. Uma em que temos a mancha urbana pré-existente, ou seja, na data inicial, e outra que temos as novas manchas urbanas. E neste, este índice consiste então em delimitar um buffer em volta destas novas manchas urbanas, sendo que neste estudo se adotou o metro, que é o que os autores uh, recomendam, um, e sim, quando este buffer intercepta em mais de 50% a mancha que já existia, considere-se que o crescimento ocorreu por colmatação. Se este buffer interseccionar a área pré-existente uh, em menos de 50%, considere-se que o crescimento urbano ocorreu por contiguidade. Quando este buffer não interseciona qualquer mancha urbana já existente, então o crescimento urbano diz que ocorreu por dispersão. Então, só para quem não conhece Braga e Guimarães, eles localizam-se no norte de Portugal, mais especificamente no noroeste. Em termos de dados e métodos, eu recorri então a seis imagens do satélite Landsat, distribuídas por três sensores, a partir das quais derivei um conjunto de índices espectrais, que foram posteriormente classificados e combinados para extrair sete componentes biofísicas, sendo que eu aqui apenas vou analisar as componentes biofísicas urbanas, ou seja, as superfícies impermeáveis antrópicas, correspondem essencialmente a áreas edificadas, estradas, parques de estacionamento pavimentados e as áreas industriais e pedreiras. Ah, sendo que procedi também ao isolamento das manchas urbanas entre cada, uma destas, entre cada uma destas datas, e sendo a partir desta informação, então, que procedi ao cálculo da proporção do crescimento urbano relativamente ao tecido urbano que já existia na data anterior, calculei também a, a taxa de crescimento urbano anual de modo a neutralizar a diferença no número de anos abricados em cada um destes intervalos e, para então identificar o modo de crescimento urbano, recorreu ao Landscape Expansion Index, sendo que o valor médio deste índice traduz a maior ou menor compacidade do crescimento urbano. Por fim, a partir desta lei do urbano, procedi ainda ao cálculo da distância média de cada mancha à sua vizinha mais próxima em cada data. A aquisição sequencial de imagens Landsat permite não só observar a evolução e a configuração espacial da área urbana de Braga e Guimarães, como também descrever e quantificar o processo de urbanização que lhes esteve subjacente. Uh, em termos espaciais, entre 1984 e 2016 notam-se mudanças significativas em Braga e Guimarães. Uh, desde logo, denota-se a expansão dos núcleos urbanos uh, principais, uh, sendo que Braga apresenta uma mancha urbana claramente mais contínua do que Guimarães, onde para além do núcleo urbano histórico são perceptíveis um, um vasto conjunto de outros pequenos núcleos uh, distribuídos por todo o município. Uh, por sua vez, a partir do centro urbano de Braga emerge uma estrutura urbana radial comandada pelas vias rodoviárias em direção aos municípios de Póvoa de Lanhoso, Marge, Vila Verde, Barcelos e Famalicão. Relativamente a Guimarães, esta um, ligação aparece de modo mais tênue por força das condicionantes da topografia uh, nesta área aqui assinalada. Uh, Existe um importante interflúvio, ou seja, onde a elevada altitude e declive constituem então uma barreira à urbanização. Hum, de destacar ainda neste período o aparecimento de novos clusters urbanos, ou seja, isolados, ou seja, do tecido, que já, do tecido, do tecido anterior, particularmente em Guimarães, quando comparado com Braga, e a abertura de novos eixos viários, alguns dos quais de alta velocidade, que são particularmente visíveis nos intervalos de 99 a 2003, ou seja, que, dos quais se destaca a conclusão da circular urbana de Guimarães com ligação à variante FAF. Um, neste set, não se consegue ver correto. Neste, okay, não se consegue ver no setor este do município. Uh, bem como o aparecimento do primeiro elemento urbano que liga Braga e Guimarães, conecta Braga a Guimarães, que é a abertura da autostrada A11. Por sua vez, em 2003 uh, e 2007, destaca-se no setor sul do município de Guimarães a continuação da A11 em direção ao Penafiel onde termina. E entre estas duas datas de destacar que foi a realização do Euro 2004. Ou seja, os, um, o impacto do Euro 2004 não foi só na construção de estádios, não é? Por exemplo, em Guimarães optou-se pela reabilitação do que existia e não pela construção de um novo, ao contrário de Braga, mas ficou muito marcado pela criação de novos eixos viários, particularmente no período que antecedeu a realização deste evento e no que o imediatamente sucedeu. Então, os aumentos sucessivos de tecido urbano consumaram-se numa redução significativa da distância média a que cada mancha urbana se encontra da sua vizinha mais próxima, ou seja, passou de cerca de 130 metros em média para 44. Uh, em termos mais quantitativos, de destacar que Guimarães 
detém sempre maior valor absoluto de tecido urbano, também de referir que Guimarães possui, em termos absolutos, maior área. No entanto, em termos percentuais, a porcentagem de território impermeabilizado é sempre mais elevada em Braga, nas, em todas as datas em análise. Hum, assim, apesar do tecido urbano exibir um crescimento médio linear entre 84 e 2016, denotam-se variações espaciais e temporais em Braga e Guimarães. Hum, entre 1984 e 99, verificam-se então os incrementos mais significativos de área urbana nos dois municípios. De facto, estes 15 anos representam cerca de 30% de todo o crescimento urbano verificado nestas três décadas, e sendo que hum, este, ou seja, o tecido urbano verificado em 99 corresponde ao triplo, em Guimarães e muito próximo de Braga, do que existia em 84. No entanto, se nós considerarmos os valores entre 84 e 2016, o, é, o tecido urbano em Guimarães mais que sete aplica, ou seja, mais sete, amplia -se mais de sete vezes, enquanto em Braga este aumento é de seis vezes e meia. Hum, então, em termos de crescimento urbano anual, para neutralizar então esta diferença no número de anos de cada intervalo, hum, de destacar que entre 80, nos intervalos de 84 a 2007, a taxa de crescimento urbano é mais elevada em Braga e a partir desta data passa a ser então em Guimarães. De notar que entre 99 e 2003 verifica-se então a taxa de crescimento urbano mais elevada de todo o período em análise em Braga, ou seja, período em que por ano foram convertidos cerca de 2% do território bracarense de uma superfície permeável para uma superfície urbana. No que se fala então ao modo de crescimento, porque uma determinada taxa de crescimento urbano pode ter diferentes modos, denota-se então no conjunto de toda a série analisada, dos 32 anos analisados, que a colmatação em Braga ocorre essencialmente em torno do núcleo urbano principal, ou seja, onde em 84 ainda subsistiam uh, vastos espaços uh, vagos, bem como também uh, em torno de novos espaços urbanos que se originaram por contiguidade ou a partir do crescimento disperso. Uh, a contiguidade ocorre essencialmente em torno do núcleo central de Braga, ou seja, onde temos então as manchas urbanas de maior dimensão, e ao longo das vias rodoviárias que comandavam o processo de urbanização. A dispersão surge maioritariamente nas áreas periféricas do, do município, ou seja, por tradição de segmentos urbanos minúsculos, que em muitos carros respondem a, a habitações unifamiliares e isoladas. Em Guimarães, nota-se também a colmatação no núcleo urbano principal, no entanto, sobressai uma vastidão de pequenos aglomerados urbanos distribuídos por todo o município, onde também existe a colmatação. A contiguidade ocorre também nesta coroa contigo ao núcleo, urbano central, ao núcleo urbano central, bem como ao longo das vias rodoviárias presentes em todo o município e ao redor dos pequenos núcleos urbanos distribuídos por todo o município, como já referi anteriormente. A dispersão ela é por mais evidente, particularmente no exterior do perímetro urbano, que não parece ter contido de todo o processo de, de crescimento urbano. Uh, no conjunto, então, de, da série analisada, o crescimento por continuidade é claramente o um modo dominante, ou seja, uh, mais de 60% de todo o crescimento. A colmatação assume-se como o segundo modo mais importante em Braga, mas não em Guimarães, onde esta posição é ocupada pela dispersão. De facto, em Guimarães, a dispersão é mais importante do que a colmatação durante 25 dos 32 anos em análise. Em Braga, a dispersão apenas foi mais importante do que a colmatação urbana durante os primeiros 15 anos. Assim, este início confirma não só que a dispersão urbana é a sua maior equidade em Guimarães do que em Braga, tal como vários autores já salientaram, como também mostra que esta se tem vindo a acentuar nas últimas décadas, tal como o arquiteto Nuno Porta já antevia na década de 80. Um, o valor médio do, do, do lei uh, traduz então a maior ou menor capacidade do crescimento urbano. Em Braga e Guimarães uh, denota-se então um padrão oscilatório ao longo destes 32 anos, indicando que o processo urbano foi intercalando períodos de maior dispersão com outros de maior compactação. Ou seja, estes resultados parecem então suportar aquela hipótese de orca que eu falei inicialmente, de que as áreas urbanas formam a partir de processos oscilatórios de crescimento, que alternam de modo cíclico então estas fases de difusão, ou seja, aparecimento de novas manchas isoladas, com outras de coalescência, ou seja, em que as manchas existentes vão se crescendo em contiguidade ou por comatação e vão eventualmente se unindo numa única. Para eh, terminar, de referir que os resultados obtidos Atestam então a capacidade do lei que assenta na integração da detecção remota com os sistemas de informação geográfica de capturar as multifacetadas dinâmicas uh, do processo de crescimento urbano, sendo que esta complexidade é claramente maximizada em territórios de urbanização difusa, como é o caso destas duas áreas. 
Uh, nos, 52 anos, nos 52 anos analisados, não se verifica um modo uníssono de urbanização, dado que há parte do domínio não é percentual de crescimento em contiguidade, observa-se uma oscilação de fases de maior dispersão com outras de maior comatação. De facto, os que os modos de crescimento eles operam em todas as datas em simultâneo, pelo que a simplificação dicotómica definida por Dietzel e por Herald, que é grosso modo perceptível, tal como a imagem anterior mostrava, ela poderá não abranger a total complexidade espacial e temporal deste fenómeno. Assim, a despeito da vastidão de estudos empíricos desenvolvidos nos últimos anos, melhorar a compreensão das dinâmicas urbanas, o conhecimento profundo dos padrões e dos processos associados à urbanização, e no caso específico aqui da urbanização difusa, que é um tipo de urbanização muito particular, com características muito próprias, é ainda limitado, em consequência da sua reduzida ligação com modelos teóricos compatíveis, tal como alertam alguns autores. Uh, por fim, de referir que o lei utilizado neste trabalho poderá dar um contributo importante para esta questão, uma vez que permite a estandardização dos estudos sobre o crescimento urbano e a comparação de diferentes realidades urbanas, bem como de distintas escalas geográficas e temporais. E é tudo. Muito obrigada. Obrigado, Catarina. Um, we have now time to move uh, to questions. They can be in English, uh, Portuguese, or any other language. Yes. Thank you for the presentations. Um, I would like to ask Rodrigo, when you do this very rigid structural analysis of your context, how do you see, because it's a bit like parametric uh, um, predictions, and how do you see your own agency within this group, and your, how can you affect this group as observer? Do you see yourself observing? Um, I assume that you are asking uh, in respect of the formal modeling part. Uh, yeah. Um, That's a really good question because, in a, in a sense, when you ask like what kinds uh, th that you are parameterizing the, the, the analysis, which is obviously true because otherwise you couldn't formalize it, um, there is this question that you can always increase the number of parameters almost well to the extent of your computational power. So it's not as if you are beginning with a, with a very well defined uh, structure and you're just going to have to fit all of your data into it. Obviously, there, th that will have to happen, but yeah. And uh, as to how I see my agents, uh, that, uh, that's actually a, a complicated issue, like epistemologically, because uh, I would say that I don't really care about my agents and that I don't really care about anything, uh, uh, anything other than the, 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 stru the structure, which might sound a bit mean, but by which I mean that the people themselves, uh, the, the, the people themselves in this particular case and their quarrels are not, at least, in my, uh, are not the subject of what I am studying. I may try to intervene in their reality, but I don't see that as the necessary end goal of doing these sorts of analysis. Especially because, I, uh, at least I wouldn't trust myself using any of these models to actually do any sort of predictive asse uh, ass assessing of how things are. But I, I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I answer, uh, but. Ah, no, 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 no. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, in, in this context, I, um, basically at least though, because obviously the, that, uh, that modeling part stems from the semiotics, but in terms of the semiotics, I'm pretty anarchic in that sense. I don't identify people as belonging to the culture. I only go for whatever they, they I identify as. So I would go to a, to, to a given context, and the first thing I would ask is whether they feel they, I, they belong to the place or in what way. And uh, from there, I will. That, that is the first cle uh, cleavage that I'll, that, that I'll put in. Uh, I don't. 
I mean, I don't feel it's my right to project structure onto the individuals, and that's why I won't be, uh, th that's why the, the, those pictures that, uh, that people take are not interpreted by me, because I don't feel, uh, uh, it, it, at least it, it seems very counterintuitive that I would ask people to take photos and then interpret them myself. Instead, I would prefer to go with the people and ask them what the, those things mean to them. But your, your question is really, I'll, I'll probably have to think more about it because I, I'm not sure that, I, that there, is any, uh, there is a solution to that because I'll always have to isolate a given population to study them, but my isolation is by itself a, a, a determination that they are something that I think they are. But you know, we do what we can. Any, we have some questions there. I, I know the idea with ABM is to keep things simple in the, the modeling of agents, but uh, did any uh, power um, patterns emerge? You said generational patterns emerged from your model. Did any power conflict patterns emerge as well? Do you plan on introducing things like that? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I, I mean, I, I, as a sociologist, I felt uh, like the worst person ever when I, when I had to reduce most of my structural re relations to one variable, which I define as social influence. But something did happen, like uh, mostly as an artifact of the computation, but which I found very interesting, which is defining that social influence as like a random float number, so just a series uh, uh, one with a zero a series of what? Um, and not using the whole of the, uh, uh, of the number, having it cut at a certain point for, simpli for, for computational like economy, at some point, you could lead to situations of, of a sort of dictatorship where a given set of individuals would be determining the whole evolution of the system without, uh, without actually having, uh, uh, having been programmed to do so. Like they were obviously more powerful, but it, the model should assume everyone's, uh, everyone's interpretation. So yeah, there were some, some subtle th uh, things of that, but it, I mean, I wouldn't be very happy with them to be honest. Anyone else? Um, I have a quick question for uh, Katarina. Um, it's uh, uh, it w it's um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll do it in Portuguese since her presentation was in Portuguese. Foi uma uma pequena uma pequena um, coisa que me que, que me fez um, um fiquei uh, a questionar que é quando no fim refere uh, e muito bem que o tipo de urbanização de Guimarães é, é um tipo de urbanização difusa, se isso não está, depois no, no, nos dados de gerais, dizia que a, a característica mais forte daquele, da, daquele, do crescimento do território tinha sido contiguidade. E normalmente nós associaria, associaríamos uma urbanização difusa mais a... a um tipo de crescimento disperso e não contigo uh, porque difuso normalmente está associado a isto portanto se isso não é contra, não parece haver ali uma pequena contradição no caso específico não uh, no caso específico não por um motivo muito simples o crescimento difuso ele não cresce disperso isolado no meio do monte no meio dos campos ele cresce em contiguidade com a rede viária. Portanto, a rede viária é aqui considerada um elemento urbano. Uh, que eu, só de, de explicar que o, tudo que é considerado urbano é tudo que é impermeável. Okay. Logo, quando temos um crescimento contigo às vias, que é o que acontece muito na urbanização difusa, uh, ele está a crescer em contiguidade. Daí a dominância também da, da contiguidade. A uh, contiguidade também acaba por ser sempre a classe mais representativa por causa das classes que o próprio autor... Uh, refere que é tudo que seja abaixo de 50, ou seja, ele só considera disperso aquilo que é mesmo igual a zero. Portanto, ou seja, mas na, voltando só através à sua questão, uh, como o crescimento disperso, difuso, ele cresce então associado à rede rodoviária ou então a casas que já estão às vezes localizadas no outro lado, ele acaba por apanhar no fundo aquela mancha urbana que já está ali localizada. No more questions? No one? 
Okay. Uh, well, thanks, uh, everyone, then. Um, it was a very enjoyable session. Uh, it was a, um, a pity that uh, the Brazilian uh, group didn't come um, because th they actually bridged uh, some things with, uh, with Catarina. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed it and uh, w we can now proceed to... Hmm? Uh, we can proceed to the poster session and uh, again thanks for coming and uh, see you shortly. Uh, just a, a note before the lunch time, we would like to inform that Yuri Paish, Zaki Habibi, Duncan Crowley, Joana Alves, Daniela, Daniel uh, Simslu, <laughs> and Caterina Di Giovanni uh, will be next to their posters if you want to ask them some questions about their work. Have a good lunch.